Yeah, we'll go do something shortly, Benny. Welcome back. You know, it was over 50 years ago that I first strapped on a model 1911 Remington Rand 45 Auto and carried it on duty at the 551st MP Company in Fort Polk, Louisiana. And then later on, I carried another Remington Rand 1911 with the 25th Military Police Company in uh, Vietnam, Coochie, Vietnam. Uh, of course, it was a different sort of gun than this. This is a highly stylized uh, Ruger SR 1911, uh, stainless steel. It's got uh, larger sights on it, no back sights, and all these uh, fine uh, features that uh, have modernized it. And uh, of course, this has the straight back strap whereas the uh, version that the military carried ever since uh, World War II had the rounded uh, spring cover. So, and my, my holster was carried up closer to my waist. I, I like this, this drop feature with the uh, swivel because uh, it, it fits my reach a little bit more handily. And uh, these, uh, this pouch here is uh, later you know, much, much later vintage, uh, but it's very handy. It's got the Velcro. So I've kind of modernized over the years. And uh, here I've got my, I've got my K-Bar, got my K-Bar knife, as I had with me in uh, Vietnam. And um, not, it wasn't just, it wasn't just Marines that carried uh, K-Bars. A lot of, uh, a lot of uh, U.S. Army personnel carried K-Bars. So anyway, you know, I was just going through my archives and I discovered to my great amazement that I had not posted the special video that I did on the 1911 and 45 uh, Auto 45 ACP cartridge. This, this round right here. And um, so what we're going to do is I'm going to post that video you're going to see that um, it's somewhat dated. Um, I did it two and a half years ago in May, and um, I was outside at the barn at the time. And you'll see that I was wearing my uh, Ruger Red Hawk 44 Magnum on my uh, Diamond D chest holster. And the reason for that is because April and May is when the bears have just come out of hibernation and they're, they're really ravenously hungry. And uh, they've, they've surprised us out by the barn on a couple of occasions. So I uh, don't want to have uh, any entanglements with uh, Benny and a bear. And certainly with me, I don't need that either. So uh, you'll, see that, you'll see that certain things are changed. I'm uh, two, and a half, two and a half years of more gray hair and less of them. And uh, Benny is now a little bit more, he, he gets a little bit more sleep than he did back then, but he's still doing great. Um, but I hope you enjoy this uh, following video, and um, stay tuned. Welcome back. Well, today we're going to talk about the uh, 45 automatic. That is the, uh, the round, not the 1911, and it's uh, the various firearms that shoot the 45 auto and um, the 45 the 45 auto has very frequently been referred to as the 45 ACP and that's become a popular name for it um, it's not exactly the appropriate name for it because uh, the 45 ACP was actually the name given to given by Colt to the to the gun itself to the, the 1911 which they produced but, you know, in common usage, 45 automatic Colt pistol, 45 ACP became synonymous also with the, the round, <laughs> the 230 grain full metal jacketed uh, round that was uh, so frequently associated with it and for so, for so long uh, was used by the military. Um, it's a little bit of a curious history behind the uh, 45 auto the um, and that's another thing I would just stop for a second you know in uh, in in, co in common parlance for so many years 
people who grew up in my generation, when they said, you know, I'm, I shoot an automatic, I shoot an auto, they did not mean that they shot a full auto. That, that's something which, you know, that distinction was not lost on us. We understood the difference between full auto and uh, automatic, but we generally meant automatic, meaning that it, the cycling was, the cycling, uh, was auto, an auto loader style. So, um, you know, I don't want to, please don't write into me and tell me that, you know, the, the, the 45 auto is not a full automatic. I know that, I know that. Um, but the, uh, the 45 auto was chosen essentially after uh, a rather critical uh, series of incidents that occurred during the Philippine insurrection uh, in, the, uh, in the Philippines has a very complicated political history behind uh, the Philippine insurrection. Um, it was, um, the U.S. had acquired the Philippines uh, following the uh, Spanish-American War uh, as part of a settlement. The uh, Spanish-American War that uh, took place, I believe, was 1890, it began in 1898. Um, and lasted a very short period of time, two, I think it was less than two years. Um, the, uh, it, it was a war that broke out, uh, hostilities broke out between Spain and the United States after the sinking of the uh, USS Maine in uh, Havana Harbor in Cuba. And uh, a lot of things fomented uh, around that sinking, to this day, nobody is entirely. Nobody can be entirely sure whether it was, uh, whether it was a you know en enemy sabotage by Spain, uh, or if it was perhaps an accident, an accidental explosion, uh, or whatever it was. Nobody entirely knew, but uh, there was there was a lot of there was a lot of uh, emotion going on between the two between the two nations. And so war broke out between the two, and uh, there were no allies on either side. But subsequent to the settlement and the, um, uh, the acquisition, you might say, of the uh, islands, the, the uh, Philippines, um, in the Pacific, the uh, Americans got involved with uh, what was then called the Philippine Insurrection. The Philippine insurrection involved a lot of, it was basically there was a, a civil war that broke out, different factions, and uh, we, we became uh, tied up in it with our own military. My great-grandfather fought in the uh, uh, Spanish-American War and uh, served for some time in the uh, Philippine insurrection. Um, and it, it, was a, uh, it was a very confusing time. The, um, but between, for, for a period of, that lasted over a decade, there was the Moro Rebellion, M-O-R-O. -O, and it was, uh, the Moros were a um, Muslim faction, uh, rebel faction that uh, bubbled up. And uh, they, they led devastating uh, suicide attacks on Americans and, um, and on some of the Philippine government uh, soldiers themselves. So, um, th it was a it was a time when uh, it was a time when the U.S. was finding that uh, some of their some of their armament uh, that they had uh, was just not well suited. I spoke earlier about the uh, seven by fifty seven Mauser being used against um, the Rough Riders on at San Juan Hill. I'll digress and talk about that a little bit, but. That was being used against our 3040 Craig. It was, uh, the, the Mauser was found to be superior in terms of uh, uh, reach. Uh, the actual ballistics wasn't a lot different than our 3040 Craig in reality uh, with, the am with the ammunition, the bullets that they were using, but uh, it, was deemed to be, it was deemed to be superior uh, in terms of its reach and uh, the actual gun that fired it was a little bit more effective than our uh, Craig, um, the Craig Jorgensen rifle, had an awkward loading and things. The, um, excuse me for a moment, I'm just going to wet my whistle. So 
So that was found to be a gun that needed replacing uh, on the, shortly on the heels of the uh, Spanish-American War. Then with the Philippine insurrection, uh, they discovered that the 38 long Colt that was issued to uh, American troops was not at all sufficient to stop uh, these Moro uh, attackers. And in some cases, they just, they just came straight through a, you know, a hail of bullets and 38s wouldn't stop them. So that was deemed to be uh, an, ins an insufficient caliber. Oddly enough, uh, the um, the government did some they did some testing which today would be classified as rather uh, abhorrent. Some of it was actually, as a matter of fact, some of it was uh, uh, rather weird. Uh, they were tests done on cadavers and and um, on uh, live sheep and things like that. That these days would certainly be classified as uh, you know cr cruelty to animals and things. But um, and a lot of it was taken. You know, a lot of that stuff took took place in uh, rather, you know, in, in secret, in, in silence, the, the way the government military uh, conducts most of its testing. Uh, but probably what's most curious is that the government went, chose to go right back to where they started out uh, many, many years before with the um, 45 uh, revolver, with the, with the uh, single action army revolver. So they chose to go back to the same caliber and almost the same, almost the same uh, ballistics. The 45, the 45 autos ballistics are not quite up to par with uh, the uh, issued uh, 45 Colt, or popular, popularly called the 45 Long Colt, and that's again a that's a, a popular attribution which really does not signify a, an official cartridge name. So they decided to go back to the 45 caliber bullet. And uh, they, they uh, in turn, in, in, and in turn with that, they wanted to go to a, uh, an automatic. The, the, Germans had, the Germans had already gone to uh, automatics. Other foreign governments had already gone to uh, automatics. I say automatics, I mean auto-loading pistols. Um, and and we, were still, we were still using revolvers. So that became uh, an issue too. Um, so the, there was one person who collaborated with this whole thing, as he had been doing for so many years with so many different uh, firearms, um, John Moses Browning. John Moses Browning invented the uh, 45 ACP, 45 auto cartridge, um, in 1904. And um, the gun that the gun that it went you know, that it went into uh, didn't come out until, you know, was not released and, and uh, taken by the military until 1911, until after 1911. But, uh, you know, its, its development and formation paired up to make a pretty nice team. Um, the uh, 45 auto, uh, the 45 auto pistol, uh, the 1911, uh, served uh, throughout the First World War in quite a number of campaigns and uh, served throughout the Second World War and the, the Korean conflict between in 1950 to 1953 and uh, it served with me uh, when I was in Vietnam. Um, it continued in service uh, up until the uh, mid-80s when it was uh, supplanted by the uh, Beretta um, 9mm Luger. So, and the supposition is, the common, the common supposition is that the uh, military largely decided to go to the uh, Beretta for quite a number of reasons. First of all, uh, greater firepower, you know, the, the seven round magazine for a, a 45 ACP had, it was limited in capacity. Um, and it was it was heavy to carry. I can guarantee you. You know, just just had a uh, you know just a couple of magazines on your belt, uh, and and that gun. It you know there was there was some there was some weight there. Uh, it wasn't that wasn't bad, but considering the weight that you had, you didn't have much to go with it. You didn't have too many rounds. So um, 
that was that was the consideration. But it, largely, it was uh, it was more the recoil issue. The 45 auto is not a particularly friendly uh, cartridge for many people to shoot. Uh, it was it was adopted as a it was adopted as a um, firearm to be used by by anybody. Uh, but the trouble was that not anybody could shoot it. It was something that uh, you either you either could or you or you had difficulty with it, and uh, so much so that um, the military decided that uh, in World War II, uh, rather than issuing it uh, to uh, officers and and people who uh, couldn't handle it that they uh, came up with the uh, 30 M1 carbine, which could be issued al as an alternative to the uh, 45 uh, 1911. So, but going back a little bit to, going back a little bit to uh, that era when, when the uh, cartridge, the, the, the 45 auto was invented, it was a pretty colorful time. Um, wasn't a particularly, it wasn't, that does not necessarily mean it was a good time. Uh, there were a lot of problems going on in the country at the time. Uh, you know, there were, there were riots in America, there were, you know, labor riots. Uh, there were, um, there were different uh, issues going on uh, that um, America was dealing with. Certainly it didn't, it didn't uh, enjoy the idea of sending off troops to um, Spanish-American uh, war and uh, the um, the actual Spanish-American War was very very short-lived. In fact, um, it's one of its most colorful participants was uh, Teddy Roosevelt, President Theodore Roosevelt, who was president from 1901 uh, to uh, 1909. Now he fell into the he fell into the presidency because um, he was the vice president under. President McKinley, and President McKinley was assassinated, and so uh, he he put on uh, he put on the uh, uh, he had to take on the role as uh, finish out the term as uh, president of the United States. So, uh, but he was a popular, colorful guy. He was he was very well known. Uh, and what what led up to his becoming? Vice President under McKinley uh, was his uh, surging popularity after he had um, commanded a bunch of troops called the Rough Riders up uh, San Juan Hill in, in Cuba during the Spanish-American War, and uh, although it was a you know short-lived a short-lived period of uh, conflict, um, you can't imagine anybody doing this sort of thing in today's uh, in today's uh, political. System, uh, it was really weird. Uh, he he was the um, sec assistant secretary to the Navy, and when the Spanish-American conflict broke out, he decided that he was going to he, he quit his he quit his post, and then he formed up this uh, ragtag group of people who he called the Rough Riders, and um, he he was already quite well known. He was uh, he was internationally famous as a um, Hunter, adventurer. Uh, he was he was a rich guy. He had a lot of he had a lot of money, and um, he he didn't mind. He was one of the f first people that took advantage of uh, you know the movie camera. You know a lot of a lot of footage, still footage of him uh, exists. He loved that limelight, and um, when uh, when he he formed up that that uh, ragtag troop of uh, uh, soldiers called the Rough Riders. That they, they were they weren't U.S. soldiers. A lot of people think they were U.S. soldiers. They weren't. They were they were a combination of cowboys and uh, actors and you know famous all kinds of people who just joined up. They wanted to be with they wanted to be with Teddy. Um, and curiously, when when the um, when the ship disembarked from uh, Tampa, Florida, to uh, Head down to Cuba. Uh, a lot of the a lot of the cavalry horses got left behind. A lot of the people who was in his rough rough rider unit got left behind. It was kind of confusing. It was a little you know when you look back, it was a little bit comical. 
So, uh, but you can't quite you can't quite imagine these days how this would ever occur, where you know essentially a, a bunch of uh, belligerents would just uh, enter into a conflict like that uh, with with without having some sort of uh, <laughs> U.S. U.S. government sanctioning. They they just they just landed in Cuba, and uh, they they rode they rode right past they they charged up the hill right past U.S. soldiers that were already there. Um, and kind of took over, and um, Teddy Roosevelt, you know, he said he he had a he had a, a bully good time and all that sort of stuff. Well, his um, military campaign as a self-appointed uh, colonel, um, and I think he was uh, serving under uh, under General Leonard Wood, and Leonard Wood is the one who's uh, the uh, military fort Leonard Wood is named after, but. Um, he was. Uh, you just can't imagine that. I mean, you, you try to try to imagine that going on today, and where a, I decide I'm going to gather up uh, my my gun blue 490 fans, and we're going to, you know, we're going to go over to uh, such and such a military hostility and take over. But that's what he did, and he got away with it, and he became very famous, and uh, that led to his being. Uh, elected as governor of New York in uh, 1899, and then subsequently that fame led him right into the uh, vice presidency. And then when McKinley was shot, then he became president. So it was that era, and of course in 1903 you had uh, the Wright brothers, you know, flying a, the first the first aircraft at uh, Kitty Hawk, a little glider with a. A bunch of bicycle parts and a small, small engine. Um, so, the, uh, the the time was the time was just about right for all sorts of things to go on, and and uh, military uh, military armament was really changing radically in a hurry. If you look at um, if you look at the 45 ACP, how long it's been around and how long it's uh, remained uh, such a, a, a solid. Uh, you know, a, a solid cartridge for, uh, for, well, since uh, it's it's 109 years now, right? So something doesn't last that long unless it's uh, unless it's worthwhile, despite the fact that so many people have a difficult time handling it. Uh, it's one of those it's one of those guns that some people I I, I personally have a lot of fun shooting it. It's it's a it, I get a kick out of shooting the 45. It's um. I don't find it unpleasant to handle, uh, but certainly I've got I've got big hands and I'm you know I'm I'm over six foot two so it's it's not a difficult gun for me to handle. But I knew people who just could not could not shoot it very well, and a lot of it was because they just complained about the uh, recoil. And also too, uh, people of small stature, light framed individuals sometimes uh, create a problem uh, by their own. Uh, by their own in inability to provide a firm platform against the uh, the cycling of the gun, because it's a uh, recoil-operated handgun, and recoil-operated handguns that that have that size cartridge have a pretty stiff have a pretty stiff spring, and that spring needs to have a firm it, it needs to have a firm. Uh, resistance in order to actually cycle correctly. Otherwise, you end up with what's called limp wristing, and and the the, the slide will only cycle halfway back, and it it won't uh, it won't complete the uh, chambering or ejection. So uh, that's that was that was a number of that was a number of issues that uh, cropped up through the years with the 45 auto. Let's take a look at the ballistics. It has uh, it, it has in its um, full metal jacketed military skin. Um, it it travels out at 850 feet per second out of a five inch barrel, which is curiously the same speed that a 158 grain uh, lead bullet was traveling out of a 38 special that was invented uh, two two years earlier in 1902. So while the um, the 38 Special uh, didn't didn't gain much traction for a long time until the introduction of uh, hollow points, expanding bullets. The uh, 45 Auto 
uh, really didn't need to have the expanding bullets because remember it's frontal area that does the that does the jo the job. Um, where a 38 special ends up after it's ex expanded is where the 45 uh, where the 45 caliber bullet starts out, and um, so it and it was also a very heavy bullet. Uh, energy is very low. You're only talking about, I think it's 369 foot-pounds of energy. We're not talking an awful lot of energy, so it's not energy that does the job, but uh, it's big heavy bullet uh, smashing into things, especially uh, encountering bone. Uh, I, I knew of a couple of instances where, you know, 45, 45 auto bullets striking heavy bone uh, smashed them. I mean, uh, there was one, there was one incident uh, where, where a, uh, a sergeant down in uh, Fort Polk when I was down there, uh, he had to fire on he had to fire on somebody uh, down at the down at the fort, and uh, struck him. You know he, he aimed for his legs. He was a good shot. Uh, in fact, he was he was our he, he was our uh, instructor down there. Uh, he he smashed the tibia with one one round, struck the struck the tibia of uh, of uh, of an individual and uh, smashed it and it put the guy immediately down. So it, it, had, that, it had that capability. Uh, you know, you it, it, takes a, it, takes a big, it takes a big, heavy, hard bullet to, break, to break, break bone, especially traveling at only 850 feet per second. But the, um, you know, and as I spoke about the uh, 38 Special uh, in another earlier video, the uh, the 38 Special, uh, you know, came up in stature once you know, expanding bullets uh, were able to replicate that that uh, that pathway through uh, tissue, and uh, you know, could also inflict uh, the tissue damage because it's it's the tissue damage, it's the frontal area of the bullet that gets much of the job done. Now there are other there are other popular bullet weights now that are available with the. Um, 45 auto, uh, the uh, 180 grain bullet is uh, very speedy. You can get it. You can get it out of a gun at about uh, 1,100 feet per second. And uh, the 200 grain bullet uh, is is also a very good choice. They're typically uh, semi wad cutter designs. Benny, be good now. Benny, Benny, no, over here. Benny, here. Come on. Don't be a grouch. I know. Yeah, he's he's being protective. He's uh he's had a he's had a tough he's had a tough couple of three days. He he sprained his knee and we don't know. We hope he didn't do any serious damage. But his his hind left knee he uh, he strained it somehow. He was chasing he was chasing a chipmunk out in front of the house, uh, and. Um, we don't know what he did, but he he wrenched his knee. He came up he came up holding his holding his leg up in the air, and he'd been going around kind of limping for the last three days. And the first day he didn't like it at all. He was going around the house growling. He, you know his tail was wagging. He wanted to come over and be petted, but he was growling the whole time. That's that's how he complains. So uh, so he's on uh, he's on um, some anti-inflammatories right now and. Um, Hopefully that'll, in in some time, uh, not too long, he'll he'll uh, be fully recovered. He's he's pretty good at uh, doing performing his own uh, therapy. He he comes out in the backyard and he walks around a little bit, you know, like he's exercising it. And he's not putting his he's not putting his full weight on it, but he uh, sometimes he he bounces around the house. He looks like a kangaroo. His, his back end bounces around as he's hobbling on one leg. <laughs> so he's, a, he's a character and we're blessed to have him. But um, the, uh, the 45 Auto is, um, is a great, it's a, it, I think it's one of the most fun cartridges that I've ever had to shoot. And especially it's, you know, it's a sentimental favorite for me. You know, it's, uh, I have, uh, it's kind of a nostalgic thing for me to, uh, have a 45 auto, which was a gun that I carried for two years in the military, in the military police, um, and uh, I enjoyed shooting it then, and I, I still enjoy shooting it. It's it's not a gun that uh, comes up with very high recommendations for a um, 
self-defense, you know, a carry gun, a concealed carry gun, it's just, it's just big. And if it's not big, uh, it's, it's light and kind of nasty to shoot. You know, you start getting these, you start getting these um, uh, foreshortened versions of the 1911, they can, they can get to be a handful. Um, and uh, I've found also too that, um, you know, you, you, ha you, have to, you have to be a little bit reasonable. You know, if you start shortening up one of those guns too much, you end up with no magazine capacity, which you had very little to begin with. So uh, there are better choices out there that, that uh, these days, you know, can develop the same sort of expansion. And, uh, you know, the, the uh, military's choice to go to the 9mm Luger and also to the, the FBI, uh, largely that has to do with the combination of uh, uh, increasing firepower, available firepower in the magazine without increasing weight substantially. Um, and uh, also too, you know, with with the uh, with the velocities that that cartridge can produce, uh, and the expansion, uh, they can do some pretty devastating uh, wound damage. So, the 45 Auto uh, has had a storied history that um, it's also it's it's also backed up by a bunch of stupid legend. There's this stuff that this stuff that um, Guys brought home from World War II tales of what the what the cartridge did and everything, and it was kind of kind of absurd. You know, people, you know, being being struck in the thumb and being flipped over three times because a bullet hit him in the thumb. And uh, you'd hear, uh, believe me, I heard stuff like that. Uh, that's that's a little bit silly, uh, but it is a it is a powerful stopping round, and um, it did serve well in the uh, in in uh, at least four at least four wars that the uh, U.S. was in. And it's been used all around the world in less significant uh, campaigns. Uh, and it's still now and then, it's still used by uh, special forces and things that, uh, you know, when they, when they deem that they have to have a heavier, a heavier gun for whatever, a heavier projectile for, it, for whatever reason. So, uh, and with its, um, you know, with its plus P loadings and a uh, jacketed hollow point, uh, just like the just like a 38, just like a 357 can expand to a 45 diameter, uh, 45 can expand and, and get up to close to 50 caliber. So it's it's a pretty it's a pretty uh, big it's a pretty big bullet to be flying around. Um, I think the uh, I think the 45 is probably going to be around as long as as long as centerfire cartridges. It's not going anywhere soon. Um, it's it's a it's a terrific it's a terrific round, uh, especially it, it's a very accurate round, extremely accurate. It's uh, it was very well, it was very well designed by John Browning, and uh, you know it's uh, it's probably one of the most accurate handgun rounds that was ever uh, conceived. Uh, it has won very a lot of national matches, um, and it, uh, it it will continue to do so. I'm sure. Um, I'll talk about the 1911. Uh, some other day. The uh, that's a that, I think that's one of the I think that's one of the finest designs that that ever came out and and there are countless there are countless handguns regardless of what the way they look there are countless handguns that have the same type of uh, recoil operation mechanism that uh, John Browning uh, incorporated in his gun uh, with very much very similar features. So uh, you know, whenever you whenever you look at a Ford, whenever you look at a uh, recoil operation uh, handgun, you you look deeply, and you're going to see traces of the 1911 throughout it. So uh, very very similar designs. So I think that's about all I have to say about the um, about the uh, 45 Auto and uh, the uh, time that it was the time that it was uh, introduced and why it was introduced. Uh, I, hope to, uh, I hope to see this sunshine pretty soon so that uh, this, this, we, t we actually get a real spring. It's, I think it's going to turn into summer before we have spring. It's, it, it's cold. We're supposed to, believe it or not, we're supposed to be getting snow tonight. This is, uh, this is unbelievable. I mean, we're well into, uh, we're well into May now. And uh, we're, we're ta they're talking about uh, the, the uh, 
my NOAA radio is uh, announcing that we're supposed to get uh, snow. So that's weird. But anyway, thanks for watching. Don't forget to subscribe, and uh, Benny and I wish you would do. God bless.